Hello and welcome to this week's Stock Spotlight, brought to you by FinMeUp. We keep you updated and in the know regarding all things stock market related. This week, we're taking a glimpse at Gem Fields and their massive share buyback program that has just been completed. Tiger Brands and their new CEO, will he be able to turn the ship around? Higo then offers some insights into his favorite stock of all time, Santova. We then shift our focus to the tax dispute between Coronation and SARS and how this might have affected their results. Last but not least, Bytes Technology, a firm favorite of David Shapiro, their results are looking good. But for now, over to you, Paul and Higo. Entertain us. Thank you, Ingrid, and welcome everyone once again. So before we start, you can see this jersey has got some years on it, but I'm going for the box by nine. I previously said six, but then the seven to one split, I'm going box by nine. Paul, what are you going? Uh, I'm looking at the history. I'm looking at the charts you go, and I'm saying box by one. Box by one. I go out three weeks in a row. My heart can't do it again. Anyway, let us know in the comments. What's your prediction? Uh, it's it's going to be very interesting. Jumping into the money matters, Gemfields is our first company. They completed their $10 million share buyback program, uh, which is now around 4.83% of their issued uh, ordinary shares. We've spoken about why share buybacks are good, less outstanding shares. Uh, even if the revenue is flat, earnings can grow because, I mean, you, you basically own a bigger portion of the company. Uh, Gemfields is one of those companies that have got a lot of things to like. The management are experienced, they are on a low valuation, they're sitting on a lot of cash and not a lot of debt, but then there's also the risks where they are situated, uh, the cyclicality of mining and gemstones. Paul, what do you think of Gemfields and what insights can you give us? Yes, I kind of like Gemfields. We did speak about Gemfields about a month ago, so John, you can just link the video maybe in this corner, everyone, so you can just look at that five minute to 10 minute insights what exactly the company does and the risks and the potential upside and so on. But like you said ago, we've spoken about share buybacks a lot on this channel. You can either return value to shareholders in the form of dividends or share buybacks. And of the two, I like share buybacks more. Uh, like you said last time, I kind of like what you said. You said out of all the potential investment opportunities, we see our share as the best investment. I like that. I like that a lot. So yes, so looking at the share price a chart year to date down a little bit over the last year very, very flat but over a three to five year period great results for jam fields and let's see where it goes from here even though the share has been stagnant they've been paying really really nice dividends i think it's uh, around a 20 percent dividend yield uh with a low pe ratio so there's a lot of things to like uh, i'm quite interested i haven't pulled the trigger but i'm i'm keeping a very close eye next company is a company that we haven't really covered a lot but it's probably a company you, you've eaten some of their products, uh, that is Tiger Brands. So the news for Tiger Brands is that Mr. Noel Doyle will step down as CEO after the board concluded that the new leadership was required to respond to the challenges currently facing the company and uh, basically the economy. The earnings per share from total operations for the year ending 30 September is expected to decline by between 2 and 9%. Uh, what can you tell us about Tiger Brands, Paul? Tiger Brands, once again, a holding company. So one of these holding companies, people always ask, okay, but it's a big company where I've never eaten, where Tiger Brands, how does it work? If there's no Tiger Brands brand, everyone. They are own different companies and they actually have about 10 or 11 um, subsidiaries who all generate over a billion rand a year, which is massive. This includes like the Tastic Rice, who, Mrs. Balls Chutney, All Gold Tomato Sauce, uh, you know, many, many of these very popular household brands so yeah the last year like they said during the results they did struggle a little bit they had like a listeriosis uh baloney story where people died and there's a court case still ongoing with that there's load shedding that really hampered the south african economy and especially like they're a food producer so that's like a direct um you know they directly exposed the load shedding so it really sucks for them so they really felt that and then also the input cost of many of their products increased so if you have higher input costs, of course, being in the in food where margins are so tight uh, on the input side, that sucks. And then you have the retailers like ShopRite and Pick and Pay, who, who essentially are now the buyers of these products. They also put price pressure on, on these guys because they need to sell it to the retailers, the, the, the customers, you and I, who are also very sensitive due to high inflation. 
Um, and of course, they compete with like household brands. Like you get, yes, you get all gold tomato sauce, which is great. But when push comes to shove and they increase the price too much, ShopRite will bring out the household tomato sauce and Pick and Pay will do the, exactly the same. So you also have that pressure. So yeah, not a great year, down 20% odd for, for the year. Um, but I did see that the market really liked this move where a new CEO will now step in. So let's see, let's see, like the Pick and Pay CEO, maybe these guys can turn the ship around. Awesome. Now for my baby, uh, my biggest holding, Centova. Uh, we've cover covered this countless times. We also did a deep dive. Uh, the link is in the description. You can check that. So Centova is my largest holding and they didn't post a great trading statement. So this was for the six month period. Uh, so let's quickly go through the results and then I'll give you some, some insights. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Uh, we'll see if I can answer that. So their revenue is up by 3.3% to 330 million Rand. So up 3.3%. Profit for the period is down 25.8%. Earnings per share down 23.7%. And the net VAT asset value per share up 31.4% to 8 Rand 30. Okay, so revenue up slightly, profit down. So let's get into it. So the gross billings, which is, so basically they are, they take a percentage of the volumes with shipping and, and with even uh, air freight. So they take on the, Total billings, the gross billings, they take a margin and that is their revenue. So the gross billings is down 16%, yet the revenue up is up 3.3%. How, how does that make sense? That is because their billings margin increased uh, by 2.2%. So they make more on the billings. That's basically what happened. Their cash on hand is now around, it's 467 million Rand. And this is a 1.1 billion Rand company. So almost half of their market cap is cash. Uh, cash on hand, cash and cash equivalents. And this is really good. I love to see this. Uh, and that brings me to their debt to equity ratio, which is 1.5%, which is really good. So they, you know, this is a tough economic cycle, especially for them. They've got low debt. They've got lots of cash. They've got a PE ratio, even with uh, the earnings that fell still below six, uh, which is very well priced, especially if you look at overseas competitors, because it's important to note that Santova's offshore earnings is more than 70% of the business. So this is a global business, even though they are small cap, the UK is doing really well. The rest is struggling. Uh, for example, in Australia, they lost a big client, but you know they are really diversified in the client base, so they, they don't have the client concentration risk, but obviously you don't want to lose a client. Uh, but they've mentioned that they're onboarding new clients, and we saw in the previous the annual results earlier this year where they did a presentation that they are busy onboarding clients, and they, they're acquiring new clients, it's organic growth, and that's what I like to see. Get a client now and expand as time goes on. The net asset value, uh, this is the first time in very long that the net asset value is actually greater than the current share price. Uh, and it's around a rand more than the current share price. The reason why the net asset value is usually below the share price is because Centova is an asset light business. They are a supply chain solution, so, or freight forwarding, whatever you want to call them. They don't own the ships, they don't own the airplanes, they just make it easy. They make object A, uh, go from X to Z and, and that's where they make their money. So to see that the net asset value gives me some, some confidence as a shareholder. Uh, the cash generated from operations for the period decreased to 25 million Rand from previously, uh, well, the last year it was around 120 million Rand. So that decrease is not good to see. Uh, obviously it's all about cash, um, but that is mostly due to the lower earnings. Uh, and once again, it, it, it is sort of a cyclical business because we saw the the jewelry world container index uh, being the common indicator for shipping rates went down from nine thousand seven hundred dollars in january 2022 to now or in september 2023 1400 so down from nine thousand seven hundred to thousand four hundred that is a massive drop in the shipping rates and obviously the higher the shipping rates the more money sent over makes it's basically demand and supply and there's a few reasons why that has dropped. I mean, economic conditions, uh, there's less supply chain struggles, uh, consumer spending is lower, uh, companies have upped their inventory levels. So, so there's lots of reasons for that. And, but there are those cycles in the shipping rate. So it's good to see that even though with a low shipping rate, they're not that heavily affected. Obviously, Centova repurchased a lot of shares, uh, which uh, around 1.3% of their issued share capital. 
Um, I, I'm bear with me. I, I know it's a lot of insights, but those who is interested in Centavo will like this. So Centavo repurchased 1.3 percent of their issued share capital, uh, around 950 per share, was a 944 per share. Once again, share buybacks. They're sitting on lots of cash, low debt, so they can do this. What this also means is they mention in the results, and this is my last comment about Centovo, their appetite for acquisitions has returned and they will continue to grow the appetite for acquisitions as industry earnings return to pre-pandemic levels. So obviously, obviously the smaller players in the market that's struggling with these lower shipping rates, uh, with challenges in the global economy and, and, and the entire sector. So what we've seen previously and historically from Centova with acquisitions, they buy low at low valuations and they grow not like rapidly, but just systematically, organically, and they scale their earnings from there like they did in the US. So, you know, overall, I'm not going to be surprised if I see acquisitions in the next six months. I mean, they mentioned they've, they've got an appetite and I like that. Uh, you know, buy small at a low valuation and price it makes sense and grow it uh, sustainably. So the question, what am I doing with my Centova shares? I think it's going to be a, a tough rest of the year. It's going to be a tough, maybe even two years. While the shipping rates are low, they are going to feel the pressure. While the global economic, dish, economic conditions aren't great, they're going to feel the pressure. But I'm buying more. Uh, I, bought, I bought more shares this week. Uh, obviously, it is my largest holding and I added even more shares. So I am heavily concentrated, which I'd, I'd probably not recommend. And do not take this as financial advice. This is a company that you know I've been following and I'm happy with the risk that I'm taking. Um, so I added more just because, you know, sure, they are in a tough cycle and it's, it's probably going to last longer. But I bought this share for the long term, you know, and long term is in six months. Six months ago, they posted great results. And everyone was like, you know, Centova is a great company, just buy, just buy. Um, but I bought then because I, I'm buying this for five to 10 years unless something fundamentally changes, which it hasn't. So overall, I'm buying, I'm buying more. Anyway, let us know in the comments if you've got further questions. Next company, which I'll give over to you, Paul, Coronation Fund Managers. Their earnings per share for the year is expected to decrease by between 55 and 65 percent. What can you tell us? You know, it's a big decrease in earnings. Why? Uh, ouch, that, that really hurts. So two, two things. Firstly, they're an asset manager. So like Alan Gray, Satchik, Signia, Old Mutual, all of these companies, they are a product of the market because how they make money is via the AUM. So the assets under management, how many people's money, how, mu how much money are they actually managing? And so just on a normal level, like all the money that they already have is down now because the market is in a recession the last year or year and a half. So that's the first thing. And also it decreases because there's way more outflows than inflows. People are not investing at the moment. People are struggling. So they're actually taking out their in investments. So your AUM on that front is also now decreasing. Lastly, also performance fees. That's how they also make money. If they perform, they get some bonuses. There's no performance because the market is flat sl slash decreasing. So no money there. So all the asset managers are kind of struggling unless you have some random influx of money coming into you, which is not the case um, for Carol Coronation. I don't think it's the case for any, any one of them. And then secondly, the big issue here, I think that is probably the reason for this massive uh, decrease in earnings per share is the tax dispute. They had like a massive tax dispute with SARS. Uh, there's, a, there's a Coronation branch uh, overseas and there was a disagreement with SARS exactly what went down there and it cost them a, a massive amount of money. There's a court case and all of that. So yes, that 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 they re really took a, a big hit there specifically. So you, you won't see the other asset manager managers struggling this much because Garden Nation had this weird case with SARS. But but all of them are are not in a good place. And, and hopefully, as the as the bull market returns, as the market recovers, we will see an influx of new money, and the existing money will also increase, and then they will do well again. So the final company bites. Uh, their revenue grew by 16.3 percent. Gross invoice income grew by 37.6 percent. Gross profit grew by 15%. Operating profit grew by 12.1%. Cash grew by 44.4%. Cash is king. Uh, or cash flow is king, rather. Earnings per share and airline earnings per share grew by 17%. So Byte is a company that was unbundled out of Ultron. Uh, it's mostly in the UK. Uh, for more insights on Byte, this has already been a very insightful video. Hopefully you found, found some uh, good insights. Uh, David Shapiro. Uh, who is an amazing figurehead in South Africa as, as a market commentator and an analyst and just legend. Uh, we interviewed him a while ago. He covered Bytes a, a, a little bit deeper. 
that link is in the description as well you can check that video if you want to dive a little deeper into bite uh that's that's it for this week remember stock spotlight is every week uh, on fridays we share these insights uh, and some extra opinions let us know in the comments if you have any questions and let us know what you think of these companies if anything interests you and uh, may the box win we back our boys cheers